Good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight, is, this is the beginning of our policy review committee meeting on October 14, 2024. We have uh, three policies to, uh, to discuss this evening. Uh, our first policy would be policy 622 GA SB statement 34. Gatsby 34, if you take a look at that one, was recommended uh, by our monitors um, and what is basically an accounting related policy and it ensures that the governmental accounting standards are adhered to um, by our business office. They are, we're on it every year, uh, but nonetheless, uh, they recommended that we put this in policy um, and it's pretty straightforward as you can see. Okay, does anybody on the committee have any uh, questions? No. I actually have a question. Um, do you guys have any auditor come in prior to the end of the fiscal year in June? Like, do you have them come in like in January, February, like for the previous year or the year that you're about to, I guess, file? Like, do you, when do they come? What's the schedule? Yeah, the, the auditor will be coming in about a month. And they, what they do is they monitor the previous. <laughs> Um, yeah. the previous school year. And, and, and they make recommendations, obviously, you know, in regards to this. Okay, so it's at the end of the actual calendar year. Yeah, it, it's the school year. Our calendar year is different. Mm -hmm. we're, yeah. yeah, we're July 1st and July 1st. Yeah, okay. Good question. So with that being said, does anyone else have any questions? Then we can move that into first reading. Right. I'm not asking you, but I'm, I'm, saying, I'm just saying it out loud. Yeah, we're fine with moving to first reading. Got it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I forgot to say this before the uh, policies tonight. Um, obviously, we are expecting some commentary on some of our policies we're discussing. We will be having a, a, a portion during our CAL meeting where we can uh, ask you to come up and uh, you can say uh, your commentary or express what, any concerns or any questions. Okay, I just, it just doesn't normally happen during policy. Do we need to take attendance, Mr. Scott? Could. Okay. Who, uh, we, do we need to do that? Julie Olson. Right, okay. Okay, Bucky Scott. Tanya Bell. <coughs> Valerie Fackelman. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, all right, so as far as our second policy, policy 624 uh, regarding fringe benefits. Okay, 624 is a policy that was recommended by Patrick to have taxable fringe benefits. Um, an example of that might be, and this hasn't happened in quite a while, but uh, nonetheless, um, it's still a recommended policy. If, for example, the uh, facilities director used one of our pickup trucks to drive back and forth from work, they'd have to declare that on the taxes. Um, in practice, when that was done a long time ago, they absolutely have to do it. That doesn't happen anymore just to avoid this issue altogether. However, uh, we were updating the financial policies for the school district and uh, PASBO recommended to us that we include this. Um, so this will be a brand new policy for the district. Does uh, anybody in the committee have any questions? Yeah, so am I hearing right that um, after we did like an audit of like what policies we had for finance, we didn't used to have a policy for this in the past? It did not. And we did, in we, practice, and it we, was did, well, we did, we were supposed to, but, but yes. we just didn't have a policy for it. Right now, nothing that you know of falls under this policy, but we need to have it in yeah, place. The only time I can recall um, something like that happening you know, was if you had to go way back to, to when like, Jim Harris was superintendent okay. and um, Casey was involved with the facilities. That was the only instance where this type of thing Oh, and he exists. had like a, he yeah, had like a, a, a pickup company. Truck, yeah. so, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. And it was handled yeah, appropriately by our business yeah. manager also. Is there any other questions from the committee? Okay, so we're gonna move that to first reading also. 
So at this time, we're going to uh, discuss uh, policy uh, policy nine. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Tom, our superintendent. All right. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about Title Nine one more time, um, and uh, based on some of the inquiries I'm starting to get from the community, uh, I understand that there's a lot of concern related to this policy. So I, I want to start a little bit further back in the process instead of starting with exactly where we are right now. Um, so just, again, a little bit of an overview and background. The intent of Title IX is to protect students and staff from discrimination. That's the intent of it. And the reason that we're here right now talking about it is not because the Daniel Boone Area School District is looking to change any practice that we really have uh, of any significance. It really is because the federal regulations were updated in 2024. So prior to 2024, uh, the federal uh, government updated Title IX in 2020, and at that time we updated our Title IX policy, and now again with the federal regulations being updated, we now have to update our policy one more time, um, just to stay in compliance with the law. Um, really, the changes within the, the Title IX regulations primarily hit on the procedural side of the house, procedural differences from the 2020 version to the 2024, specifically talking about how we investigate a complaint, the report and outcome determination process, supportive measures that we have to have in place, as well as the appeal process. So very much managerial, you know, how we handle um, types of um, discrimination cases. The issue at hand, though, is somewhat related. The elephant in the room is, what bathroom do our students use? Do our biological boys use the boys' room? Do our biological girls use the girls' room? Completely understand where you're coming from. However, I think it's important to understand that that guidance comes from law. That is not coming from a Daniel Boone decision, and that decision was made six plus years ago um, and this, the school district has been operating in accordance with that law for years at this point. The Daniel Boone Area School District actually does a really nice job, uh, again, I still consider myself new and objective coming in from the outside, navigating some of these tricky waters one-on-one -on -one with families. Just to provide uh, a little bit of perspective when we're talking about how many students are we talking about, in the entirety of the Daniel Boone Area School District, we have four students that identifies transgender. One of those, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, one of those students is in the middle school and three of those students are in the high school. Of those students, um, in, in an ideal world, uh, you know, we're able to work with these families and we have um, uh, nursing bathrooms. At the high school, we even have uh, single stall bathrooms. And just about always, we're able to navigate those waters successfully. Um, we're, everybody is, is comfortable with the outcome. Two of, of our students, and I do want to make sure I, I reiterate, we're talking about kids. We're talking about our students here at Danny Boone that we try to take care of. Um, two of our students uh, do not use a bathroom that's connected to their biological um, gender. So with that case, again, we work with our students. Um, if the thought is, that we have students coming in and you know every day they're like, oh, I, I want to go in the girls' room because I identify as a girl today, I want to go in the boys' room because I identify as a boy today. That's not happening here. Um, we work very closely with, with our families and there is a process to get to this point. So I just wanted to lay that out. The district right now, we're not looking to change any of our practice. We're not looking to combine bathrooms. We're not looking to add litter boxes. I read everything on on Facebook about you know some of the allegations that the school district is is looking to do that, that's not it the law has been in place and we have to continue to follow the law um, what else do I want to say here the, the process so where we are in the process uh, we brought uh, the title line updates uh, to the committee last month there were some questions and comments and requested revisions to that policy. So per our policies, specifically policy seven and nine, we brought it back to the committee to make some of those revisions, review it, and then continue to move that forward. This is not a process that is rushed. Policy work is some of the slowest work that we do as a school district. 
Um, and if everything were to progress um, at the fastest rate possible, we, the board would not be looking to uh, officially approve this policy until the end of November. So again, we're not talking about a very fast process here. Um, but this is a process, specifically Title IX, is one that is tied very, very closely to the law. As such, um, we have Alexis Spurlock from our attorney's office here today as our legal expert. Um, as we continue to do some digging and uh, answer some questions that, that our board members have, there are a couple of updates that I asked for her to, to come and prepare. Um, some things that are really important for you as individual board members to be aware if you choose to support or not support um, the compliance with the law. Hi, it's nice to meet all of you. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the contours of Title IX and where we are. And just to top on what um, Mr. Wilford was just talking about, <clears throat> that is what the accuracy of where we are. In April of 2024, the Department of Education updated the regulations, which is why school districts have been moving forward and changing their Title IX policies. And I do want the district to understand that districts all over the state are grappling with the implementation of Title IX because of these changes, these changes that are um, you know, up for legal challenges in many other states. But I wanted to emphasize that there are no lawsuits that are impacting the state of Pennsylvania on the whole. Um, you may have heard about there's a case in Kansas um, that is impacting some certain school districts in Pennsylvania, but Daniel Boone is not impacted by that lawsuit. Um, and I can talk more about that if you have questions about it. The Department of Education on August 1st, they hosted a webinar um, about the trying to give legal updates on what was going on with Title IX, and they confirmed that they will be enforcing the Title IX regulations in all states and all schools that are not subject to any of these legal injunctions, um, these lawsuits that are going on across the country. And Daniel Boone would be subject to that. Um, and I did want to note that there are still state laws. There's the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act that does require the district to not discriminate on the basis of sex. In 2023, the PHRA did change their regulations, the state law, to define um, discrimination on the basis of sex to include actually more categories than Title IX categories. Uh, but it does include gender identity, include sexual orientation, um, and many similar um, definitions. And those have not been challenged, and those are still current. And even for the past year, those have been coexistence with Title IX. Um, and the last thing I do want to note um, is that because Daniel Bloom is not subjected to any of these current lawsuits, um, that board members may be subject to personal liability for not enacting policies in compliance with the update for the regulations. And we can talk about that more if you have questions on that as well. But those are the kind of the four big points that I wanted to just update you on as to wh why we are where we are and what the situation is currently for Daniel Bloom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the context behind Title IX. And I'm sorry, I just joined you. I'm Alexis Brock. Alexis. You call me Alexis. Sorry. I will probably get that wrong. It's okay. I apologize. It's okay. Yeah. All right. Is your mic on? Okay. Um, Excuse me. Could you speak up, please? Yes. I'm so sorry. I'll bring this a little closer. Um, I had some questions uh, with Subarus the last time because. Um, I guess like, I'm just trying to understand what's the difference between law and regulations. Because I mentioned the Chevron case of 1984 indicates that as a school district, we don't have to abide with regulations or mandates coming forth from federal agencies. The Department of Education is considered a federal agency. And I don't remember the reasoning why he said that this was not applicable. And please, if you could refresh my memory, that would be great. But I'm, I'm under the impression that if we don't follow through with this, that we can lose over $400,000 of federal funding. So if you can provide some context, that would be great. Sure. So the case that you're talking about that overturned Chevron is actually called Loper. Um, and Loper did not say that just because it's a federal agency that the school district doesn't have to comply with their regulations. Um, what Loper said, so Chevron was a case law that had been, um, I want to say since the 70s. Um, and so what Chevron said was that when departments, when federal departments enact, let me back up one second. So there's a state stat, the federal statute is one sentence that says you must not discriminate on the basis of sex. That's Title IX. And so through that statute, which is the federal statute, that's when the department can enact regulations. 
So what Chevron said back in the 70s was that when that these federal departments are their best suited to determine what the regulations should be that interpret the federal statutes. Because they are the one that are experienced, right? So we're not talking just about the Department of Education, the FTC, the SEC, all of these departments. So what the court said is that if a case was brought before a court that was challenged, then the courts were supposed to give deference to those agencies, that the law and the regulations were consistent with what the law is because they are the best ones to interpret it. So that's what Chevron said. Loper now is saying, that when a, a case comes before the court, so let's say for example, if someone challenged, you guys are the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, if someone challenged Title IX before the Eastern District of Pennsylvania here, then that court in the past with Chevron would, have, would usually say, the Department of Education is best suited to interpret that statute, so we're gonna go and to go that what their regulations are good on their face. But now with Loper, what they could do is the court in EEPA could make their own independent judgment about whether the Department of Education was acting appropriately. So that's the difference. So nothing, Loper may impact some of these lawsuits that are going on across the country, but they've not, it has not yet. But that is what would happen. That makes sense, so thank you. You're welcome. And one of the other questions, well I actually had a couple of questions. Um, there was verbiage um, in the policy which number are you looking at? Um, I'm still at the Title IX, but I'm looking at the Title IV definitions, page two. Um, it says, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefit of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Um, and so, my interpretation here is because law and regulations are up is that discrimination is not clarified because it's not listed in the definitions. So anybody, in my personal opinion, can massage discrimination to mean whatever they feel like they want it to mean. So that quoted statement in that first case, that's actually what comes out of the statute. That's, that's the sentence from the federal statute. And I believe that since, and I didn't, at least Mr. Volker was just looking at this, I think there is now a definition of discrimination in the policy. That was one of the questions from Ms., when Mr. Stubers was here, I believe. Yeah, the last paragraph before, the last paragraph before statement on non-discrimination, or uh, page one. It says, please refer to district policy 103 and 104 uh, regarding uh, discrimination. Where is that? I think it's defined then in 103 and 104. Here we go. It's right here. I think. Oh, yeah, that's the sex discrimination. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's the second one we have here that's showing the edit in red. Yes, it's practically yeah. on page five where it says sex discrimination. Yeah. yeah. And those were some of the requested revisions after the last policy committee meeting. And it's legal that there were these suggested revisions? They came from legal. All right. Yes. Then I guess they did. Yes. I was giving her a few minutes to read it. Do you have any more questions? Yes, I, I actually won't. While I'm looking through that, my other question last meeting was, does this policy have an age limit? And I was told it doesn't. So there is no statute of limitations on Title IX. So you could have a student who, say, is 21 years old and comes back and makes a report of something that happened to them while they're a student. But one of the things that um, you look at in deciding whether you have jurisdiction over the conduct or whether you'll move forward with a Title IX complaint is whether the district in investigating the complaint is able to prevent any further discrimination or harassment from happening. So say, for example, it was two students, a student on student um, Title IX allegation of harassment. If both those students had graduated, then the district wouldn't be investigated because there's no remedy that they can effectuate because the student is gone. 
But if, say, a student comes back at age 21, I actually have dealt with this um, recently, where a student claimed to be um, abused by a um, employee at the school when they were in high school. And so that was investigated because that individual is still an employee at the school. And so certainly that um, harassment environment could still potentially exist. So that's part of what goes into the analysis of the Title IX coordinator deciding whether to move forward with a complaint or an investigation from a complaint or not. Because there was a concern that <clears throat> Sue was mentioned that this policy is applicable to every aspect of the district. And you know, there are after school activities such as sports, mm -hmm. musicals, concerts, you know, band, choir, and under policy, if for some reason, and the question was using the restrooms, at any point we, we wouldn't discriminate against anybody, against their gender, if they wanted to choose the opposite restroom. That was the concern. That was at least the question that I had last time. Is I'm, I'm completely okay with during the school hours because the bathrooms here at the school are meant for students and then the faculty have their bathrooms. It's really the after school. So under this policy, does, does this policy allow anybody identifying with the opposite gender, their biological gender, to enter any facility that's located for a, what you would call a cisgendered party? So I just want to look at the exact language before I... Um, but it is anyone who has, who is attempting to participate in any school-sponsored school sponsored activity. So Sponsored activity. Yes. So, uh, so then it's not applicable then to after school activities. It is if it's a school-sponsored activity. So say for example, it's like a back to school night or something and you have people who are here. Yeah. Right, so then any adult that's attending right. could, could potentially bring a complaint forward. And just because they bring a complaint forward, you know, that's, that's the analysis of what the Title IX coordinator does, is when a complaint comes forward, they make a determination as to what is appropriate for that complaint. Does it go to you know, a process called informal resolution where there's just an agreement made between the parties? Um, does it go to a full-fledged Title IX investigation? That's some of the procedural differences that Mr. Volker was talking about because the new regulations actually have a push towards informal resolution and informally resolving issues related to sex discrimination without going through the whole formal complaint process. So yes, they, they could make a complaint, um, but it just depends on how it would be handled I, moving forward. I think Mrs. Feckelman's concern was not a, a student at a after school, but an adult, an adult attending an after school. Like yes. would be, like how if, does that work? Like if my daughter's friends, you know, relative associates themselves as a you know, trans man and goes into the male bathroom type of thing and let's say there was an allegation that there was an assault, like, does that apply? Like, do we, where does a district, where, where are we financially and legally liable for that? So if it is a program that's sponsored by the school, so the language out of the statute is it's if they were participating or attempting to participate in the recipients, the recipient means the school, education program or activity at the time of the alleged sex discrimination. So yes, if they're here for something like a back to school night because their child is in sports, you know, if they're attempting to participate in the program, then they could file regardless of whether they're a student or not. not talking about a complaint, she's talking about using a bathroom. Correct. So you're telling me a 40-year-old man can use a bathroom with a 16-year-old girl? Is that what you're telling me? How do you want to Sounds like this, Bucky? So, so, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had this, this, I mentioned this before. I'm not trying to push you back, but we're going to have this open discussion where we do the cow. So nothing's being decided right now. It's just being a discussion. But I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but that's what I said. So we, we, we have to. So when we go. She's not answering her So. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to process what she's saying. I'm not. I'm not trying to be bad in any way. I don't think anyone said that. But she's not answering her question. But I'm just going to ask a follow-up question. So, ladies and gentlemen, so I've been asking what my son said to his guidance counselor. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Young, my son to suicide two years ago. Mr. Young, we've been asking for two years, so sorry to interrupt. All right. I'm okay. Good night. Good night. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Yeah. Oh.
So again, I just want to reiterate what Mr. Scott said. Comments from the community will be addressed during the comment period during the CAL when we're at the policy review section. Otherwise, this discussion is just between the committee members. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to ask my first question. Yes, go ahead, okay. Mrs. Butler. Thank you. Um, so I, my, my, my question actually is, is just if, it, if it's like a, a friend coming to like a um, event and they're not necessarily participating in the actual event, they're just in attendance, does this policy apply to them? That's what I'm asking. Now that they're actually participating in it, but they're on the school district's property, does this Title IX apply to that person? Someone who's just attending as a, like a spectator. Yes. spectator. Let me see if they specify. Give me, if you give me a couple minutes, I can get back to you on that. Other questions? Yeah, yeah while we're waiting. Um, does anybody else on the committee have any questions?
discrimination? Or like, even though, even though we might not, if, if, if somebody was on site and there was a, there was a, um, an alleged assault or, or discrimination, um, and that person was just a spectator, under the, even though we would maybe be following, following along the line of a discrimination investigation that Title IX would, would dictate that um, we still have, have some action to take to investigate that per the state's rules, correct? Because those were already in force. Sure, so under the PHRA, yes. Um, and as of 2023, the PHRA issued regulations that are not being challenged that does include the, right. many of those categories is under the discrimination on the basis of sex. So, it, I mean, that, that, to me, that, that indicates that, you know, we already have some sort of responsibility to people who come on, the, on site um, for um, activities, even if they're not our students. And, 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 that, and that that doesn't have anything to do with this policy that already exists. Yeah. That's correct. Val, do you have any other, or does anybody on the committee have any other questions? Tanya, do you? Good right now. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just so confused. I'm just, um, I, my question still exists unless Julia Steven answers my question. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it does. And if it does, can you please explain it to me? I want to make sure I understand. Sure. So I, I think that the answer is probably likely that someone who is here, or you know, if they're being a spectator for an activity that was school sponsored, if they're here for back to school night, whatever it may be, I think without the without the department explicitly saying so, and I think it's likely that they would be considered someone who been, you, the district would not be able to discriminate against on the basis of sex. And if we don't comply with the Department of Education. Can you refresh my memory how much money we're going to lose of federal funding? So the, the initial knee jerk was like the 400 so spent Title I, two, and four, uh, which actually is more than that. When we look at other federal funds, we well over a million dollars worth of federal funding we could potentially lose. Because my issue is, is when a federal agency comes and says do or else, I find that that is extremely troubling morally. Just in general, it's it's extremely troubling because if you hold funding from a district, you're actually impacting those kids you're saving, you're trying to protect. That's the problem that I have also. Not, not only is it do or else, but I don't know if you caught what you said right at the yeah, beginning. Yeah, we're individually. You individually can be personally liable. Oh, oh no, yeah, oh I know that. Okay. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's a hill I would die on. I, I, I'm, I'm not worried about that. I don't, I don't fear anybody that says they're going to sue me. Um, okay. Thank you. Absolutely. We fear Jesus Christ. That's who we fear. But I just want to make sure because I have to vote my conscience and I need to make sure I understand. Sure. And so the reason why the district has to abide by the Title IX regulations is because those funds are contingent on following the regulations. So one of the things that the department actually talks about in the, this preamble section is that if districts don't want to comply, then they don't meet, they don't have to get the federal funding. So I mean, that's why, that's where the nexus is between why Title IX actually applies to the district just to explain. I understand your concerns about it, um, but that is, where the, that is where the nexus is as to why the district is required to Yeah, you have more questions? So, Tom, I guess, or Alexis, at this point, we do we will take a a vote and see whether it goes to first reading or sure. is that is that correct at this point? Does anybody else on the committee have a question? I'm, I, I'm good. Maybe it gets voted on before the public gets to speak on it. No. No. So, so just real quick, and I'll, maybe Tom can explain it better than I am. So there's nothing nothing uh, happening here other than just moving it to the first reading, which means it goes to the cow. And then I'll let you explain it, because there's four steps here. Yeah, yeah. We, we would not vote on this until the end of November. 
So just so you're very clear. simply, we have board members. When we're asking questions on on this, your reaction unnecessary. The oh god, because we're trying to be informed as public people. This is our tax money that we're. It shouldn't be a oh god. Yeah, you kicked your head down. And you went oh god. I'm, I'm having a. It's, I'm having a. Problem. That's uncalled for. It's not. We have the right to sit here. Sir, hey, it's, it's, it's sir. Not, sir. Sir. He's trying to. This is not, that was not about you. It's been multiple times. No, can, can, wait, I'm going to say it. No, I'm going to say it, just for one second. There's, if you're not aware of it, I'm not going to say it, but there's a very personal issue that's happened tonight. We're all going through a really tough time. So, no, you're going to, you're going to hear that. No, but that, that, that's what you're talking about. That's all, that's all it is. That's not on you. That's not on you. I, that's all. I'm, I'm just trying to be honest. Like I'm pulling my kids out of school because of it. And you're, okay. you're saying you guys got personal issues, I got personal issues too. No, no, no. For, okay, just, why, why let's back up. Let's just back up. Do you want to hear the process real quick? Yeah, it's not, we're not like, we're, we're following them. Why did we have to find out through the third party and why wasn't, why wasn't the whole Daniel Boone School District notified of all this? What I want to know. I had to find out through Facebook. We get emails for everything else. We get emails for everything else, but you guys didn't want everybody to know about Is it. Do, didn't it go out in the agenda? Yeah. Like, yeah no, so. nobody was notified. I had to find out through his social media and his family. Why wasn't all my, my they notified? We get notifications every day. So this, it, it doesn't get past till. So when? When did you say? And and if November okay, would be so the first so time it could be passed. Sending out every parent no, notification. Sure, if you, let, or if you just let Mr. Holker explain the process. Okay. Can yeah, yeah. I'm not. We're not trying to be. Everybody just, should be notified and not just, just okay. Just let Mr. Holker explain the process. Through the third party. All right, Mr. Volker. Yeah. So just very very quickly, we have several committees. All right, they uh, collaborate, they discuss, they analyze. And then when they're at a point where they want to take it to the Committee of the Whole, that's what CAP stands for, um, it goes to the whole board then for a greater, larger discussion. And that's where more public comment is had. Um, and then after it goes to the Committee of the Whole, there's no action at the Committee of the Whole meetings. It then goes to a voting meeting. So it's at that meeting where there's actually action. And for policy, there are multiple readings. There are mo there are, it, it goes through a committee of the whole again, and then it goes to a voting meeting again. But Tom, what we heard, the the are you going to notify no everybody? everybody? everybody the committee is everybody. absolutely in charge of where the policy goes. But I heard if they vote no, they, they're liable to be sued. True. They are. But that's okay. We could go back to the we can go back to the masks about that. That was another issue yeah, that was here. Real, real quick, understand a couple of things. One, we are all on the same team. Yeah, we, we are. <laughs> we, we are. No, 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 no. You have concerns. They're personal concerns. It's fine. As as a person, I have personal concerns as well. But what we're talking about right, right now are things that we are by law required to do. We can like it. We can not like it. We can have our personal views on it. All of that is oh, all valid. Or not. But what yeah, I'm, this comes down to 400 grand. Four what, no, no, no. It's actually, as I just said, it's it's more than a million dollars, and it's also what we're legally required to do. I can't express that enough. All right, I can't just stay here and recommend to the board that they break the law. Like that's what it is. So what's the point of this? We have a committee to talk about the policy. And if there are other questions or revisions requested, we possibly bring it back to committee. That's the way that the policy work goes. But if you already have a prerequisite of what you're going to do, we, what is the point? We, did we actually don't. We, we actually don't. Like, I mean, he just said that if you don't, you're breaking the law. He can't recommend that. Correct. Well, right. But, but we, so could, we could vote right? against it. Also, yeah. he, he can't recommend that as a superintendent. The board ultimately decides what to do. So the only the only vote right now that is going to take place. Um, the only vote that's going to take place right now would be, and unfortunately she just stepped out, but we'll have we'll have to. I don't know how we get her vote. Um, it's just whether it goes to the cap, which is the next part of the meeting. That's all, and and then. I will. I'm the one who's going to call it out again, and then I'm, then we're going to open up the floor to you all speaking about it. That, it's just I, I'm just 
I've been in your place, man. I, 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 oh, they're not doing it. They're not going to speak now. They're speaking at this after. So just so you guys know, there's only a handful of board members that are in the policy committee. And during the policy committee, you guys are going to be in the board members. And during the policy committee, it's only those board members who are allowed to speak. In order for everyone to have a voice to speak on the board, we have to vote it to push it to the committee of the whole meeting, which is next. And then we as a whole board can discuss, and after we have our discussion, we open the floor up for public comment. So that's how that goes. So if you guys could just be patient, we can move on. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Val. Okay, so there is, well, there's four of us. Um, so I guess uh, we'll start, should I start? that I'm going to say yes to moving on to the first reading. That's all. That's all it is. It's moving it on to the first reading. That's, that would be so, as Val had explained it. Julia? I would also make that a recommendation, yes. Val? Yes. Okay. Tanya? Yes. Thank you. So that's, so at this point, it's moving to the cow. It's not a. It's not a in any way a done deal. So it goes there. Um, we will revisit it during the actual meeting for the cow. So I'm just being honest. Like it starts at like a seven thirty. We're gonna have a facility meeting. Just but please stay by because we're all. I know. <laughs> just to provide clarity, the other uh, policies that are associated with the title line, they just have connected regulations. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Right. So there, but everything else is going to first reading, but the, the, the t Title IX it will also be going to first reading, and we can revisit this during the uh, actual meeting. And 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 as that Val put it so correctly, um, it opens it up for the entire board to speak about this. So those who are not on the policy right now. So and and for those people who are on the board who came to this, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for the invite. I can't even know we have some reply. Okay. All the meetings are posted every Friday. I'll be waiting. I didn't get any email or anything. They're posted. I don't go to the, my kids. Go. Your agenda was not emailed to the parents. Yeah. And I well, promised you it would be emailed. Let me speak. I let you speak. Let me speak. Thanks. Um, your agenda was not emailed out. And also, I have read over the documentation within your agenda, within this title, which is considered IX under the Biden administration, it was signed in, okay? I read all through it. I read through all the legal documentation. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. She's a lawyer. There's nothing in there that was anything to do with any bathroom stuff. Nothing. There's an email right here. So if you would like us to physically show it to you, since you're telling us you know what's in there, she can tell you she's your lawyer. Let her read through it, and she will tell you the same thing. That there was nothing in there in that agenda about these bathrooms. And the statute, she okay. said there's a different statute right there that all right. is not factory like title. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Again, I, I get it. We can open this up to the floor just once we get into the cow. So, all right. At this point, I'm going to be concluding the Policy Review Committee meeting for October 14, 2024, and then I guess we're going to... I just want to what, um, You're fine. My reactions. My my daughter's having a medical emergency in South Carolina, and um, well, I was just very upset. So cool. my hand motions and my mannerisms are due to my daughter having a medical emergency Do you have in to South go? Carolina, and I I, I can't Should you go? You're all good, Tanya. It's important for me to be here. Sure. Thank, thank You're you. All good. Well, we hope she gets better. And if you need to go, go. Um, all right. That concludes our meeting, and then we'll go into facility.